Hey guys, welcome back. Just wanted to do a quick lecture on light. Um, light is, uh, this is going to be real short, I think it's 12 slides total, um, and we're just going to kind of breeze through it. If you've been through all of the electromagnetic videos, uh, this little discussion on light is going to be a breeze for you. Um, so make sure you've watched those before you watch this one, and you'll have no problems. All right, so let's start talking about light. So light is a series of electromagnetic waves. We, we call it light. Light is the only thing that we can see, but light waves are uh, a range that actually extends all the way, well, electromagnetic waves, I should say, extend all the way from X-rays, even cosmic rays, all the way to infrared, uh, radio waves, things like this, um, are all electromagnetic waves. Light waves are the only things that we can actually see with our eyes. Now, other animals can actually see things beyond what we can see. They can see other electromagnetic waves. But humans, for the most part, can only see things uh, that we see as the colors of the rainbow. And uh, we might ask ourselves, where does this come from? Where do uh, electromagnetic waves come from? Well, if you recall from previous videos, um, electromagnetic waves are, or, or, or magnetic, mag, I'm sorry, magnetic fields are induced from moving uh, electric charges, and electric charges, uh, or electric fields can be produced from moving uh, magnetic fields, or, 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 or magnetic, uh, uh, or magnets, I, I, is probably a better way of saying it. So, in the case of most electromagnetic waves that we see and deal with, these usually originate uh, from accelerated motions of electrons, right? Accelerated motion means a change. So if it's changing, remember our electrons have charges, that means you're going to get an electric field and a magnetic field at the same position. And this creates an electromagnetic phenomenon. And if you're moving things back and forth, it's not just coming out nice and straight and emanating like a flashlight, it's actually forming waves, right? That's basically what's happening here. We see electromagnetic waves being produced by this uh, charged stick that is being held by this person and being shaken in the air. And in doing so, you're creating this pattern at the speed of light, uh, granted, but the pattern nonetheless. So what is an electromagnetic wave made up then, right? So it implies that it's either an electric field or a magnetic field. It turns out it's both. Um, we have an electric field uh, that's moving in a sine pattern right here up and down, just like all the other waves that we've been talking about in the series of lectures. But uh, magnetic fields also produce waves, right? So here's the magnetic field. And in physics, by the way, the electric field gets the letter E, the magnetic field gets the letter B. And uh, this is how these things move in space. That's what's down here in this lower uh, left. So we'll give it a moment. And you'll notice that the E field and the B field are switching back and forth and that this lambda right here is the wavelength of this electromagnetic wave. And the direction, of course, is uh, from left to right, and here it's from left to right. So the electromagnetic spectrum is the wide range of frequencies that are experienced. And the, remember, the relationship between frequency and, and um, uh, wavelength are, is well established in our earlier lectures on sound. Um, so we can classify the different electromagnetic waves according to their frequencies. So the lowest wave of light we can see, it turns out, is the color red. And the highest frequency of light we can see appears to be violet. There are, are exceptions to this. There are some human beings that are believed to be able to see in the UV spectrum range. Um, an artist in particular uh, in Fresno, uh, I believe, has been demonstrated to have uh, ultraviolet vision, which is kind of cool. Um, but anyways, but this is a, a, an extreme exception. For the most part, we can see between red all the way up to violet. Um, higher frequency of light is ultraviolet, uh, more energetic and causes sunburns. This is why you want to make sure that you're careful at the beach. The ultraviolet radiation is very high energy. It's got relatively high frequency, and it's, it's not comfortable on the skin. The body's not uh, intended to be subjected to it. Uh, beyond are x-rays and gamma rays. Obviously x-rays are so high energy that they can actually uh, emit straight through human bodies when we use them for medical research, but they can also cause cancer. Um, so we have to be careful um, how we use these. And there's really no sharp boundary between regions, right? So radio waves kind of blend into microwaves. Microwaves are used for everything from cell phones um, uh, 
to actually microwave ovens use those wavelengths. They basically are, are irradiating your food with microwaves um, and that actually causes it to cook. Uh, infrared is the next range that we feel, we've t actually talked a lot about infrared, but we feel this as heat quite, frank, quite frequently. Uh, the visible light spectrum is this little band, right? We can actually see very, a very small amount. It's right here. And that's what we see as red, orange, yellow, green, indigo, blue, and violet, uh, Roy G. Biv, or blue indigo violet, I should say that in order. Um, and then above that is ultraviolet, which is actually quite a wide range, and that blends into the x-rays and into gamma rays. So this is why ultraviolet is so dangerous, is it's really just a step below the x-rays. You've got to be really, really careful. So let's talk about the different behaviors of, of things to... Um, light or electromagnetic waves. And we'll find that very frequently these things operate very similarly to the manner in which um, vibrations occurred in sound sources. So, you know, if you were to go ahead and bang on a tuning fork, it emits out a wave and it causes the motion of this other tuning fork to, to sympathetically vibrate in tune with that wave. Electrons around an atomic nucleus, we usually model these uh, uh, in different ways. This is an alternative way of doing it, is we can say the electrons are, behave as though they're attached like springs, uh, following Hooke's law, of course. Um, and if we have a light wave that comes in and it's vibrating the electrons, it's going to vibrate the same way that this is uh, vibrating on top of the tuning fork uh, block. So uh, anyways, the idea is, is that if you happen to get something at the right resonance, um, you'll excite those electrons, and those electrons will then pass that information back out. And so how does this happen? So how light penetrates transparent materials such as glass? So how does, you know, how does light get through things? So the way, I, you know, I like, in some respects, the way this cartoon is done, it's a little, it's a little profane, I'm talking about it as a, as a gulp and a, and a belch. But anyways, here we go. Uh, basically, we see um, a burst of energy, uh, hit the glass it's going to hit these atoms on the outside so there's going to we're going to assume that the glass is three atoms thick uh, it's actually considerably thicker than that but you get the idea so the energy comes in and is absorbed by this first atom this first atom then belches gulp and burp it burps it over to the next one so basically it's transmitting the energy to the next one which then goes into an excited energy state here uh, it can't really hold that high energy state for thermodynamic reasons, and it belches it over to the next one, right? One of the questions you might have is, why isn't it going back the other way? Well, some of it might do so, but the fact is that going from left to right is uh, advantageous to it for a couple of reasons. One, you probably have already a new beam of light exciting this one, so it's got nowhere else to go. Uh, so it goes through this to this one and eventually on out. And we see this to, you know, to the naked eye as transparency. So electrons or molecules in the glass are basically forced into vibration, right? Or exit, uh, they're basically excited. Uh, energy is momentarily absorbed and vibrates the electrons in the glass. Remember, we we're talking about how the electrons are vibrating around this atomic nucleus. And this vibrating electron either emits a photon. So we haven't really talked about photons. I'm not gonna really spend a whole lot of time talking about it in this lecture, I'm just gonna bring it up. It's basically a, a, a corpuscle of light. Uh, or transfers the energy as heat, right? So it's either going to heat the glass or it's going and, and, and we'll feel it as heat or you'll see it as light. And so there's a time delay between the absorption and re-emission of energy of vibrating electrons uh, as it goes through the glass. So it takes a while for this to happen. It's still very fast. It's just not as fast as it's happening in a vacuum. Um, so this time delay results in a lower average speed of light through a transparent material. Now this is something we have to make sure that you have firmly in mind. We talked about this in the previous lecture, that there's a speed of light, uh, we call it C, or, you know, and the, we're going to use the letter C frequently in our, in our uh, equations going forward. But the speed of light, C, um, 300,000 uh, kilometers per second, um, is constant. And it's constant for all wavelengths. So x-rays travel just as fast as 
uh, radio waves and light waves and everything. It's called the speed of light, and it's a, it's basically a constant. The way that we know that is a little sophisticated. We'll talk about that when we get into special relativity, which is actually not more than a few lectures away at this point. So we're getting really, really close to talking about some fascinating stuff uh, in terms of uh, how we look at the universe today. Uh, not so, you know, away from the Newtonian paradigm and into some kind of newer ideas. So anyways, um, what does this mean? It means that the speed of light in glass is slower than it is outside of glass in a vacuum. So the speed of light, the constant speed of light, is only constant in a vacuum, it's, and it's constant within the materials, but we just need to be aware that it slows things down. So in glass, infrared waves with frequencies lower than those of visible light cause not only the electrons, but entire atoms or molecules to vibrate increasing the temperature of the structure, right? So if the glass has uh, got infrared waves, basically it's going to be vibrating just, you know, the same thing, those, those springs uh, that the electrons are suspended from around the, uh, the atomic nucleus. So we see that glass is transparent to visible light, but not to ultraviolet and infrared light. So in this case, we've got visible light that will see the glass and it will come through. You can see the plant behind it, but the ultraviolet light can't get in. And the infrared light cannot get in, all right? So in this way, glass is actually acting like a filter. Uh, we don't really think of it as acting like a filter because we can see it, but it is, in fact, acting like a filter. And this is something that is taken advantage of by people that use window, tilt, uh, window tinting and things to even filter out some of that visible light to be able to uh, reduce glare and things like that on their cars or even on their houses. So the average speed of light through different materials, as I was saying, it varies through a, uh, through a vacuum. It's 300 uh, million meters per second, which is 300,000 kilometers per second. Uh, the atmosphere is slightly less than C, uh, but rounded off to C. Uh, usually we say it's C. Water, it's actually 0.75 C, or 75% the speed of light. A glass is at 67% the speed of light on average. Uh, it depends on the material. You can put lead in there. You can put all kinds of different things in your glass and it changes it. One of the slowest ones is actually diamond. Diamond is a, the hardest substance on Earth. Um, it actually resists um, transmitting uh, light through it. Um, but anyways, it travels at 41% the speed of light. Um, and there's some really cool consequences uh, for these things. So if you change the speed of light through different things, you can uh, do some interesting physics magic. And so there's a video here that actually demonstrates that right here on YouTube. So we're going to watch this right now. Okay, so this is actually from a newscast that was broadcast where they did the experiment to kind of show what was going on. Uh, really cool stuff. So let's go ahead and watch this newscast and they show the experiment. On this Saturday morning, we're going to change our tune a little bit here. What's a little weather coverage without a science experiment? How about that? We have Carl Nelson here from the Imagination Station. Good morning. Good morning. We're going to talk about invisibility. Ooh, okay. You hear about that in movies and in books, and let's talk about some science of how you could actually make something invisible. Ooh, I love okay. this already because right. I would love to be invisible for so, a day. So take a pencil. This is okay. something everybody's done. Just drop it in the water. Okay? Now, the pencil is not invisible yet, No, right? we can see it, can yes. See it. And you can even see that it is a little bit bent looking, if you look under the side, right? Yeah, okay, Okay, sure. so when the light bounces off the pencil, we see reflections, so we see the pencil. Okay. And then when the light travels through the water, it actually slows down. Oh, okay. Which I'm sure you've heard the speed of light's a constant. Right. And it is. It's a constant in any given material. So, it actually slows down when it goes through the water, and that causes the light to bend, okay. and the pencil looks broken. Yeah, the pencil looks like it's kind of broken on its, so it's side, which you can see. Okay. Parts. Same thing in oil. Oil has a slower speed of light than water, and so the pencil might look even more broken in there. Okay. okay? But we're not making anything invisible. No. So your first temptation would be, well, just put something clear inside something clear. Give it a try. So a clear glass rod in water, it's kind of hard to see, yeah. but you can still see it. Sure. <clears throat> the real trick here is to match the speed of light in the material with the speed of light in the liquid Only you're putting you would it in. come up with this. Okay. So, this is really cool. So All right. try this. Drop this or just slip All that right. down Look into the canola oil. Look at that. It just disappears. Huh. Is wow. Is that not the coolest thing ever? Yeah, that's pretty neat. I don't neat. know if you can see that. No, yeah, it that's is awesome. Pyrex glass rods okay. in canola oil. Those two materials have very, very close 
matched speeds of light. Now, it, does it have to be the Pyrex glass rod? That's Pyrex. important. Okay. Pyrex. So if you have some Pyrex glassware at home. Which I do, yes. Okay. You could do that in a big container of canola oil. All right. In fact, you can even have some fun drop in here. This is oil floating on top of water. Okay. And you see the glass rod on the top. And then you it You don't disappears. see it in the middle, but you see it in the bottom. Yes. All because of the different speeds of light. Huh. Okay. Wow. So in this giant container, which is empty. Right. Right. So actually down inside here, I actually have another oh, wow. big beaker of oil. Okay. Okay. And maybe you can help me hold that. That's why okay. I have the gloves on. All right. It's going to yeah. be a little messy. Sure. Um, and maybe I can pull out from inside there another beaker. Oh, wow. All of this was inside of there. All of that was inside of there. And in fact, another one? Oh, there's another wow. One. And in fact, inside there, there's another one. Stop it. Okay. Oh, look at that little guy. That's so cute. Okay, so oh. this just goes to show that we couldn't see any of this. You could not see any of that inside there. In fact, you can drop the little guy right inside there, and you'll watch it just disappear as it goes into the oil. All because, again, same speed of light in the glass as well as in the oil. Wow. It's a messy experiment, so if you try it at home, yeah. <laughs> be prepared for that. How about but that? Wesson canola oil, I have found, works the best. Okay, sounds good. That and a little bit of Pyrex and maybe some gloves, and Mom some and gloves. Dad. How about Absolutely. that? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, Carl Nelson, that's this week's Imagine It. Thanks so much for coming in, and if you're looking for something. So I hope you like that little experiment. So you can kind of see how uh, the speed of light is important for our ability to see things, uh, especially because the eye is really good at comparing uh, the appearance of different things. Um, for example, the Pyrex and the oil in that past experiment. Uh, the, it's the comparison that our eye picks up and allows us to see things. So if you have things of the exact same speed immersed, as long as there's not a color difference, you're not going to catch it. So anyway, cool. That's a cool thing. All right, so by comparison, we could talk about opaque uh, materials. So we talked about transparent things. These are opaque things. So most things around us are opaque. Uh, they uh, absorb light without re-emitting it, right? So in other words, the electron or the electrons get excited, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to emit something back out or through it. And so what's typical of this is books, desks, chairs, and people are, are all opaque. Here's a base I found online. Uh, it's clearly opaque. Uh, vibrations given by light to their atoms and molecules are turned into random kinetic energy, into internal energy. And so when you you know, put light on this, uh, all the all the different parts of the spectrum that don't actually get uh, re-emitted out as white and, and red uh, causes the base to actually get slightly warmer. Uh, it's converted into heat energy. Uh, but there are other kinds of uh, opaque minerals, or, or uh, not min minerals, I'm sorry, materials um, that we have to deal with all the time. For example, metals. Uh, you have light shining on a metal. Uh, remember, metals typically have metallic bonds, which has a lot of free electrons working through the lattice. This is really great for conductors. Um, but, uh, you know, these metal f uh, forces uh, free electrons in the metal into vibrations that emit their own light as reflection. They're so free that if it's hit by blue, it emits blue. If it's hit by red, it emits red. And so that actually gives you a nice reflection. Here's this gentleman looking into a uh, the bottom of a metallic um, object and he's getting back his reflection that we can see in the photograph. All right, so let's do a little bit about shadows. Um, so in order to understand what a shadow is, we have to define something called a ray. So a thin beam of light is often called a ray, right? So imagine a perfectly, where all the, the light uh, waves are all coming through and everything is perfectly perpendicular, like a laser beam, and that's called a ray. And when we stand in the sunlight, some of the light is stopped while other rays continue in a straight line path. In other words, it continues past you. And we cast a shadow. It's a region where light rays do not reach. So you kind of have the idea of how shadows are, right? We've known this since we were kids. Uh, my own little girl, when she was about nine months old, I remember the day that she recognized her shadow for the first time and began to play with it. Uh, nine months old. So we recognize these things very early on. Uh, either a large, faraway light source or a small, nearby light source will produce a sharp shadow. So keep that in mind. A large, faraway light source, like the sun, or a small, nearby light source, like a, you know, I don't know, like a flashlight or something, will produce a sharp shadow. shadow. So we see a sharp shadow right here. A large, nearby light source produces a somewhat blurry shadow. So imagine taking a really large light uh, and putting it next to this orange, 
and it's going to create a dispersed or blurry shadow. Okay, it tells us something about the source. That's kind of cool. Uh, there is usually a dark spot or dark part of the inside and a larger part around the out the edges of the shadow. So we look here. Here's the dark spot, and here's the uh, the kind of the blurry zone around it. That's the lighter part. The total shadow is called an umbra. So when we look here, by the way, these pictures see see the same thing: a sharp shadow, and here we can see it getting blurry as we move this light source away from the. Uh, uh, from the wall, or not just the, or actually the light source is probably staying in its same spot, but the, uh, now that I'm looking closely, the vase is actually being pulled away from the wall. And so anyways, the umbra is this nice dark area where all the rays are blocked. A partial shadow is called a penumbra. This is where some of the rays are gonna be shot, uh, uh, blocked out. So a penumbra ap appears when some of the light is blocked, but other light fills it in. A penumbra also occurs when light from a broad source is only partially blocked. So here we see a nice umbra, umbra, but there's some zones of penumbra here, and this is basically all penumbra all through here, maybe a little bit of umbra uh, shadowing here. So anyways, uh, just a quick video on light and how rays operate. Uh, remember, uh, light is constant. Um, that's going to have amazing consequences as we go forward. Uh, Hope you uh, enjoyed this brief um, lecture. If you have any questions uh, or any comments, meet me on the discussion board or send me an email. Until next time, have a good one.